Flying at three times the speed of sound, the MiG-25 Foxbat is a surprise to American intelligence. The US counters with the F-15 Eagle, America's super fighter. But when a Soviet pilot defects, the Foxbat's true nature is revealed. In the years after World War II, America's capacity to deliver an intercontinental bomb strike developed rapidly. The Boeing B-47 medium bomber was followed into service by the massive B-52 Stratofortress. The B-52 could fly at 650 miles an hour. Its range of 12 and a half thousand miles, supplemented by aerial refueling, meant that it could reach any target in the world. The B-52 was developed during the years of the Cold War and in the Soviet Union was seen as a great threat with its ability to launch a strike into Soviet territory flying over the North Pole. It inspired a search for higher and higher speeds for Soviet fighter interceptor aircraft. Soviet airspace was immense and an incoming threat could be located far away from any fighter interceptor station. While the B-52 was still in development, the next stage of American bomber evolution was underway. It was an obvious step. The B-52 could fly at high subsonic speeds. A supersonic bomber would be even more of a threat. The B-58 Hustler was not only supersonic, it could fly at twice the speed of sound. When it entered service in 1960, this powerful and sophisticated aircraft was as fast as any fighter in the world. The MiG-21 had been designed to fly at twice the speed of sound and reach an altitude of more than 60,000 feet. This level of performance was needed so it could intercept a subsonic B-52 but a bomber that could fly just as fast as any MiG-21 demanded new countermeasures. The B-58 was designed to a minimum size concept. The idea was that to keep size down, a disposable armament and fuel pod was carried under the fuselage. It was built in two parts. The lower part that carried only fuel could be dropped off as soon as the fuel was used. The upper part carried more fuel and one bomb, which could be nuclear or conventional. When the bomb was dropped and the fuel used up, the rest of the pod could be discarded, and the B-58, with a completely clean silhouette, could run for home. Aircraft evolution in the years of the Cold War was rapid. While the B-58 was still in development, a project to build a large bomber capable of flying half as fast again was gathering its own momentum. The key to such high speeds for large aircraft was the compression lift theory. The idea was that an aircraft could be designed to trap its own shock wave under its wings and convert otherwise wasted energy into useful lift. The North American Aircraft Company said that using this theory, they could build a large bomber capable of flying three times the speed of sound throughout its mission. At the time, the Strategic Air Command had commissioned development work on a nuclear-powered bomber. When North American announced the possibility of the Mac 3 bomber, the Strategic Air Command dropped the nuclear experiments and concentrated on the Mac 3 bomber project, called the B-70. They planned that the first operational aircraft would come into service in 1964. In Moscow, intelligence reports on the B-70 project caused alarm. The problems of intercepting such an aircraft, let alone destroying it, were very great. Surface-to-air missiles were rejected. Instead, a single-seat fighter with extremely high performance, controlled by radar links with a ground station, was seen to be the answer. 
Mig and Suhoi were commissioned to develop their own versions of such a machine. A second part of the requirement was that the aircraft be capable of high-speed reconnaissance. It was a major challenge to the design bureaus and to Soviet technology. Test facilities had to be created or expanded. The problems of thermodynamic heating had to be confronted. Metallurgy and electronics far beyond the Soviet state of the art in the late 1950s were called for. New engines had to be developed. Even the facilities of major research institutes like Tsagi were extended by the scope of the project. In 1960, an American U-2 spy plane took off from Pakistan on a high-altitude reconnaissance mission that would dramatically change the defense relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Development of the U-2 began in 1954. The prototype flew in the summer of 1955. At the time, American President Eisenhower was proposing his open skies policy. The Soviet Union rejected the proposal and the U-2 went into service as a spy plane able to fly above Soviet territory at altitudes beyond the range of any interceptor or missile. In June 1956, operational U-2s were stationed in West Germany and began making flights over Moscow and Leningrad. Francis Gary Power's flight on May the 1st, 1960 was intended to take him from Pakistan across the Soviet Union to Norway. On May the 5th, 1960, at the Soviet Presidium, Nikita Khrushchev announced that Powers U-2 had been brought down 1,400 miles inside Soviet territory. At the time, a major Big Four summit conference was about to be held. At first, U.S. authorities denied that the U-2's mission was espionage, but eventually they conceded that it was, and that such flights by unarmed aircraft had been going on for a number of years. A State Department spokesman, Lincoln White, was given the job of announcing that spy flights were justified. Intelligence collection activities are practiced by all countries, and post-war history certainly reveals that the Soviet Union has not been lagging behind in this field. When the remains of the U-2 were put on display in Moscow, Lockheed authorities were able to deduce that a Soviet SA-2 surface-to-air missile had knocked off the right-hand stabilizer. The aircraft had inverted at high speed and the wings broke off. Because of high G-forces, Powers was unable to reach the destruct button to destroy the airplane, and he had to eject. Nikita Khrushchev charged America with deliberate aggression and said that the world could be pushed to the brink of war. It was a diplomatic disaster for the US, but just as disastrous for Air Force strategies was the knowledge that Russian missiles were good enough to reach and disable an aircraft flying at extreme altitude. When Khrushchev arrived in Paris for the summit conference, the Allies were scrambling to try and find a way out of an embarrassing mess. U.S. President Eisenhower agreed to cancel the U-2 flights, but refused to apologize to Khrushchev for the power's mission. The summit meeting collapsed on its second day. The hopes of humanity call on the four of us to purge our minds of prejudice and our hearts of rancor. Far too much is at stake to indulge in profitless bickering. In Moscow at the MiG factory, Mikhail Gulyevich headed the team responsible for the design and construction of the Soviet high-speed interceptor project. At the same time, in America, the North American company was testing its new carrier-based attack aircraft, the A-5 Vigilante. The Vigilante could fly at more than twice the speed of sound. It could also act as a bomber carrying nuclear or conventional weapons. 
The prototype vigilante had flown in 1958, about the time the Russian Air Force funded the development of the Soviet Mac 3 interceptor. There is still argument between American and Russian authorities about the extent to which MiG used the vigilante as a starting point for their design. MiG's prototype was called the E-155. The basic design was created by Artur Mikoyan. For a single-seater, it was a very large aircraft. It had to be to carry the huge Tumansky afterburner turbojets being developed to power it. Design work continued through 1961, and by the middle of 1962, construction of the prototype began. Conventional aluminium alloys were not suitable for an aircraft that was to fly as fast as this. MiG chose to work in a material largely ignored by Western aircraft manufacturers, steel. Most of the E-155 was built of nickel steel alloys. Titanium, extremely expensive and difficult to work, was only used in places where the heat loads were expected to be highest. The structure was arc welded, rather than using the traditional Soviet method of riveting. In fact, the welding process was less labor-intensive than riveting, and since the aircraft would be much bigger than its predecessors, it was important to keep production costs down. Weight had to be kept to a minimum. To some extent, weight was traded for strength. The E-155 was designed to withstand a maximum load of only 5 Gs. Most fighters are twice as strong. But the interceptor's mission was to fly fast, and there was a price to pay to achieve extreme speed. The project's chief designer was Nikolai Matyuk. Lev Shengelaya was his assistant. Matyuk had been at the MiG Bureau since its very first day of existence, December the 8th, 1939. Forged steel was used for the main structural members of the prototype. Titanium was used for the leading edges and around the tailpipes, but aluminium was used for some of the parts less exposed to the effects of heating at high speeds. Welding was used extensively. It was used to build up some complex structural components that would have been forged in the West. This is film taken in the Soviet Union on March the 10th, 1964. It is the first flight of the E-155, the prototype of what was to become the MiG-25. In the air, the similarity in layout to North American vigilante is obvious. The main difference is the large twin vertical fins. MiG designers were concerned about the directional stability of the aircraft at extreme speeds, and there was a degree of overkill in the prototype. There were extra vertical surfaces on the wing tips and fairings which were meant to prevent wing flutter. Eventually, they were discarded but the E-155 continued to suffer from control and stability problems that took a long time to overcome. The test pilot for the first flight was the great Alexander Fedotov. As he gets out of the cockpit, he gives some idea of the size of this new Soviet interceptor. This is the test rig used to develop the radar and the weapons control.